Today's lecture is about image segmentation. And uh, this is again like a more complex problem than uh, what we studied in the last lecture, which was uh, object detection. And in this case, uh, we will not only predict like the a rough estimation, something like bonding box or the localization of your objects, but we'll try to find like fine boundaries of, of the objects which are present in your image. Okay, so that is called segmentation. And that will be the starting point. And then later, I think in next lecture, we'll see how we can extend that to semantic segmentation, which will not just like define boundaries, but will also tell you like what each and every pixel uh, is. So what's the semantic meaning, okay? <clears throat> so basically this is the uh, agenda for this uh, lecture. We have like a lot of talk topics to cover. We'll start with some of the basics and then we'll start with like very a uh, simple way of doing segmentation in your images, which will be based on using a thresholding. And again, this will be like binary segmentation, uh, if you have to say that. Then we will extend like those to some more advanced algorithms, such as region-based uh, algorithms, where again, we have two different categories. We'll try to study like how merging can be used for segmentation. And then just the opposite of that, where we try to split like your regions. And then I think uh, a more advanced uh, algorithm, which is like clustering based, that is used for segmentation. And again, we will study like two different flavors. The first one is k-means algorithm. You might have studied that in your uh, machine learning course. And then we'll have a mean shift. And again, both these algorithms you might have seen in your machine learning course. You will see like how they are utilized for segmentation in images. Okay, so these are standard clustering algorithms. And we will see like pros and cons of each of each of those. And of course, like k-means is something which you might have seen in your in your machine learning when you are uh, when you are studying machine learning that it's very simple algorithm and very powerful. And you will see the same thing here in computer vision as well. That simple algorithm can give you like very very strong results for uh, image segmentation. All right, so let's start with the first segment. Uh, let's try to cover some basics of uh, image segmentation. Uh, what it means now. Given an image, the idea is you want to divide like different pixels, or you can say like group dif different pixels based on different characteristics or properties. Okay, so when you divide or when you group, the idea is like you should be creating meaningful regions. Okay, and these regions could be like some kind of they could have like some kind of structural similarities, and they will give you different shapes uh, and. So for example, uh, the image shown here on the left, you can see this is uh, one example of segmentation where you're trying to separate maybe the lake from these mountains and from the clouds, okay? And again, uh, if you look at like the other images, these are like, uh, let's say this is a starfish, right? And again, this is a segmentation and you can say, maybe you are separating like the foreground object from the background object in a way. And of course, you have boundaries between uh, between like different part of this object itself. So this is kind of like within within object segmentation. Okay. So it has like a a, <clears throat> a very gentle meaning uh, segmentation. And depending upon like what you want to achieve in your problem, you may desire like different results. For example, this might seems might seem like a, a interesting segmentation because. You can say like at a semantic level, you are separating lake with mountains, right? But again, the issue is like, you have two different mountains. So you're also separating two different instances there. Okay, so it's not like a very, uh, very like, uh, you don't have a very clear boundary, like what exactly segmentation means in, in this case. And again, in this one, uh, you, you might define a problem that, okay, we have to do segmentation. And what we want to do is we want to segment the foreground object with the background. And in that case, the segmentation I'm showing you right now, this might not be a correct solution because in, in that scenario, you don't want like these uh, regions to be separated. Okay. So the perfect solution for that segmentation will be just like simple boundaries to create over this uh, starfish and no boundaries on the background. So again, it varies from like problem to problem, uh, what, you, what you want to achieve. But the basic goal is like, given an image, you want to partition or you want to divide like different components and 
Then the question is when you do that, so what kind of properties will you use when you say that, okay, two different pixels actually belong to same, uh, same, same segment or not, right? And again, that is defined by the problem which you're solving. And there are a lot of, lot of like different applications of image segmentation. And I think the most important I will say is like medical uh, image application. We'll see some examples here. For example, if we have to like identify the tumor and uh, those, those kind of details like in your uh, images, right? Medical images. And of course, like a lot of other applications as well in real world where you have to do video analytics. Okay, so this is not like a new problem. Uh, of course, like same, same as classification and detection, people have been studying this problem like from, from decades. And it started with like a very, very basic uh, algorithms. We will uh, discuss some of those algorithms today. And so we have like region splitting merging. We'll see how this works out. And then more advanced techniques, uh, for example, like deep learning, okay, which could give you like results, something like this which is uh, pretty pretty impressive. Like given an object, you can actually separate it from the background and you can also have very, very fine boundaries. And there are a lot of other algorithms as well, which we are not going to cover uh, in this course. Okay. Now, the idea is when we perform segmentation, when we are trying to group like different pixels, then we might be looking like at a uh, very low level, uh, at low level features, right? when we try to group them together. Because for example, if I want to say that, okay, I want to segment this, uh, this car uh, bonnet over here, right, the car hood, then a simple low level feature, I might be interested in just the color of the pixel. And that might give you, that, that might give me like a very strong signal to say that, okay, two different pixels actually belong to the same segment or not. And then I will be able to create actually this segment, right? So we need like some, low level information uh, for that. And the idea is once you have that segmentation, then you want like some high level detail in your, in your scene. For example, you should be able to say that, okay, this particular region actually belongs to a car or it belongs to the road or the tree. Okay, so we are actually moving from, we're actually using low level information, but we're moving away from like very fine grained information to high level semantic information when we are performing segmentation. So uh, as I said, like there are a lot of different techniques to perform uh, MS segmentation. And of course there are different meaning of uh, this MS segmentation. We will see like uh, what are the different variations. The basic one is thresholding. We'll talk about like, I think a couple of algorithms on, on, on this. Then we have region-based methods. Again, we will cover like two different algorithms here. We'll talk about clustering as well. And of course there are a lot of other algorithms which we will not be able to cover, but I think you will have enough flavor by talking about these. Okay, so now again, so this is like, uh, you can say like a formal definition of what we want to achieve uh, after performing image segmentation. So the idea is given an image, we want to actually find different entities or you can say like different segments which are present in your image. And we want to group them together as a, as a unique segment. Okay, for example, in this case, you can see that, uh, let's say we have some image segmentation algorithm, the output will look something like this. Okay, so all the white region is kind of a background. We are saying it's not very important. We just ignore that. And then these regions which we have identified, these are like the segments which have been detected as salient. And in this case, it could be, I mean, as a human, we can say that, okay, what's the semantic meaning, but the algorithm doesn't know it. Okay, so that will be like when we go to semantic segmentation. Right now, it's just segmentation. So it, it won't differentiate between whether this is like a facial segment or a hand segment, or this is like a person over here. It will just say maybe a foreground segment or a background segment, right? It doesn't have any semantic information at all. So let, let's start uh, the second segment. Uh, so in this one, we are going to talk about two different algorithms which are used for image segmentation. And the high level idea is to use some kind of threshold to determine like whether this is a segment or this is important segment or this is not important segment. And in this case, we are actually targeting at a very specific kind of segmentation, which is called like you can say binary segmentation, where we're just trying to differentiate between foreground pixels and background pixels. All right. So the two different algorithms we have, the first one is uh, binarization, the second is also uh, algorithm. 
and I think you're the fourth, uh, the fourth note, not the, not the fourth, the fifth programming assignment you have uh, that will ask you to implement this algorithm. So uh, play, please pay uh, close close attention to the, uh, attention to this. Okay. So let's start with uh, binarization. The the idea here is we given an image. We just want to say that whether this pixel is foreground or whether this pixel is background. Okay? And we just want to convert it to a binary image. And given an uh, image like this on the left, if you have to perform image abandonation, this is like something which is going to be the output. Now you might say that, okay, I mean, why that is useful, but if you think about this, uh, In this image, whatever inference you can make or whatever visual perception you can actually do, I mean, there are a lot of things actually happening. I mean, there are three individuals, right? And we can see a lot of details. We can see the eyes, we can see the specs here, like the, uh, the gestures they are making, the clothing, everything, right? So even after banalization, I mean, most of that information is preserved. Okay. But again, this is like uh, a lot of less information as compared to this. And there can be a lot of applications of this kind of image binarization. And of course, there's some info, there's some loss of information as well. For example, like we are in this image, we are not clear like what was the clothing color, but for some application, it might not be necessary. Okay. So <clears throat> the simple solution is, what you do, you actually just set a threshold, okay? And you say that if the intensity of a pixel location is actually less than this threshold, you say it's a background. And if it's not, then you say it's a foreground. It's, it's that simple. And that will give you like a binary image. But the question is, how are you going to determine this kind of threshold? So for sure, like you cannot come up with a universal threshold, right? Because the threshold is going to vary a lot from images to images. And the reason is like different lighting conditions and a lot of variations you have in your images. So, and that's a difficulty because even for this image, I mean, on the right, you can see like, this is a perfect image. Most of the information is preserved, but to be able to do that, you need like that, that threshold, which was able to do that. Not all thresholds will give you results like this. So that's the challenge of image uh, binarization. <clears throat> and there are different techniques uh, you, can, you can use. And I think some of these you might have seen in your mobile phones as well. When you take images and you try to adjust like the brightness of your images, right? So your, your app might be showing you some kind of histogram, like what kind of variations you have, uh, the intensity variations you have in your images. And then you might have seen when you scroll around those Access, it might be adjusting the colors and making your picture look beautiful. So again, those are some other applications, but it's like somewhat relevant. Now, the idea is we have talked about histogram, right? So in your image, if you try to plot histogram of your pixel intensities, let's say you start from, so this X axis is giving you like all the possible values your pixels can have. So let's say starting from zero on the left, going all the way up to 255 on your right. And the y-axis is just giving you uh, the count of number of pixels you have uh, for each intensity, okay? So this plot here, let's say this shows this kind of histogram for the image I showed you earlier. Now you can clearly see that this, this set of pixels here, okay? So there's a peak over here belongs to like a group of pixels, which are actually darker because it's closer to zero, right? And then you have this dip and these kind of pixels are actually again grouped together and they are the brighter pixels. And you can clearly see that these two peaks are actually divided by this kind of valley here. And if you have to divide like foreground and background pixels, you can just set your threshold at this valley. Okay, and this is going to be your threshold. And wherever you cut this, so whatever uh, value you have in your x-axis, you can use that as a threshold and then you can perform the binarization. And of course that sounds pretty easy, but in reality, what will happen is you will never get like a perfect histogram like this. There will be a lot of variations. 
But in case you have this kind of histogram, you know what to do. Okay, so that's the threshold. Now let's try to understand like how your uh, segmentation results are going to change when you change that uh, change that that threshold. So this is the original image we have, and this is like results by se selecting like one of the threshold. Okay, and in this case we can see that most of the light pixels are gone, right? So which means that this threshold might be might be too close to the darker side. Okay, because all the bright pixels are gone and then the dark pixels are still there, but it's still more towards like the darker side. Now, what you can do is you can start moving that threshold to the lighter side. Then what will happen is these dark pixels might be, might start appearing as, uh, as foreground, right? Because then these are also darker, but right now the threshold you have set, it's actually setting them as background. But this is a good result. It's not a bad result. But then if you go to the other side, if your threshold is too high, you can see like all these pixels are also counted as foreground with this. And this is like a very low threshold. Okay, so this was, this was kind of like a good threshold, which was able to separate like uh, these shady pixels with the actual black pixels. Now, this is a very good example of like why this kind of uh, image bandization is useful. In your fingerprint, if you perform like a perfect bandadation, then it's very easy to extract features from such an image. Okay, so again, this is let's say the input image, you can see like a lot of background noise here, right? But if you pass this to your image analysis or computer vision algorithm, you don't want to use these pixel values, right? You want to ignore them. So this could be like a very good pre-processing step you can perform. And again, you can set this kind of threshold, then all of these pixels, which are kind of uh, grayed here, right? Then they, they will be gone, okay? Now, this is another interesting example. And again, this is showing you how like changing the thresholds is actually uh, going to affect the final output. Uh, okay, so let's say we are focusing on, uh, this region here, I think there's some issues. So this green box should be somewhere here. Let me quickly fix that. So we are looking at this uh, green um, boundary here. Okay, and if you if you try to plot like a histogram of just this region, you will get something like this. And you can see like you have two different uh, groups here, right? So the left group is like darker pixels, which we can say that these are these are like the the circles, the darker circles over here, right? So those pixels. And again, all the background, which is kind of a uh, grayish color is this peak. So one interesting thing you can uh, observe here is, this is kind of a thick Gaussian, right? So it's a thick Gaussian. And the reason is, so if you, if you remember like your Gaussian function, you have a uh, variance, right? So variance is something, if your variance is high, you will have a thick Gaussian. And variance is like how much variation you have in, in, the, in the values of your distribution. So in a way, if you think about that, the pixels you have in these darker circles, it means that their color intensity is actually varying a lot. I mean, they are darker, that's fine. But within that darker region, they are actually varying a lot. In contrast to if you look at this peak, if you try to draw fit a Gaussian to this, the the standard deviation will be very small, right? Which means the variation is not high. And you can look at this background, I mean, it's kind of constant, like varying very little, okay? So, so the, you have these two uh, distributions here. And now it's very hard to say like, where is the valley? Where should, you do, where should you divide, right? You can divide maybe at this point, you can divide at this point, or maybe this point. So it's, it's hard to say. Now, these three are actually showing those three variations, uh, the three markers uh, we have uh, over here. This one corresponds to 110, okay? And here you can see that what's happening. So this is actually close to your darker pixels, which means that brighter pixels are definitely going to go away. You don't have to worry about that, which means that the background is 
pretty clear. You are pretty clear about the background. You, you will not make any mistakes there. But you will make some mistakes like when you're talking about the darker regions. And that's exactly what's happening. You can see like the center of these circles is actually also considered as a background, right? Which, which doesn't seem right. I mean, you do have like lighter pixels here. And that's like, uh, that, that's not good. So if you move towards the right, then you can see that those pixels are actually now actually gone and considered as foreground. So this seems like an optimal threshold for this kind of image. And again, if you keep increasing this, now you're going towards the lighter pixels. Now what will happen is definitely you're not going to make any errors in the darker pixels. So you, you have covered all those perfectly fine. But now you observe that you're making mistakes in the background and your, your circles are actually not, the boundaries are not clear. Okay, you have like a lot of leakages here at the boundary. So these are leaking pixels because this threshold is actually too close to the lighter distribution. So now this is interesting. And I mean, you can keep doing that and you can try to optimize your threshold. Now, if you, if you think about this, you'll have to do this for each image separately, which is very cumbersome. I mean, you don't want to do that, right? What if you have a million of images? Then you will sit and like just try to analyze each and every image and come up with the threshold, you will get bored. And some people might still be doing that. I mean, we don't know, but that doesn't seem like a good, good job to do. Okay, so now let's see how we can uh, do that automatically. Okay, if we, we don't have to do that uh, manually. And for that, we have this algorithm, which is called Otsu. And this is something you will do, the, uh, do for your programming assignment five as well. And it's a very simple algorithm. So pay close attention. If you follow, I think it's few lines of code and you will be able to implement this. Just try to understand like the basic concepts here. Okay, so the idea is given an image, you want to perform image finalization, which means you want to separate like foreground images, foreground pixels from background pixels. So that's the high level goal. And what this algorithm is going to do is it's going to automatically find that threshold for you, which you can use to actually separate those two categories. Okay. And how it, uh, how it does that, it will try to maximize the between class variance. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about what this between class variance is. So variance, you all know. So for example, if you have some kind of distribution, if the values of the data points in that distribution actually varies a lot, right? For example, a Gaussian, which is very thick because the value is mean value of mean is actually varying a lot, right? So that means your variance is high, but if the values of those data points actually is not varying a lot, then it will be like a very compact or you can say like a very thin Gaussian, right? So then your variance will be low. Now that's like within class, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to maximize between class variance, variance, which means that in this case, since it's image bandization, you have two different classes, foreground and background. What you want to do is the values of the pixels from one of the class, let's say foreground, should be as far away as possible from the values of the pixels, which is from your background class. Okay, so whatever that distance is, whatever that variance is, you want to maximize that. Okay, so let's see like uh, what that means mathematically. Let's say we have two different classes. We have, let's say this is foreground and uh, one is foreground, two is background. And mu is like just mean of all the foreground pixels. Mu two is like mean of all the background pixels. And mu is like mean of all the pixels. P1 is the probability distribution of the foreground pixels. P2 is the probability distribution of the second uh, of the background pixels, right? Once you have those statistics, you can compute between class variance by the simple formula. Okay, you subtract the means, take the square, multiply with the probability distribution, just add these two. So this gives you between class variance because what you're doing is you're actually subtracting the mean and then taking this uh, probability distribution here, right? And if you just try to solve this equation, uh, you will get something like this. You can open the braces here, okay? So we don't have to do that here, but that's fine. So this is the formula which you're going to use, which is giving you between class uh, variance. And what it's trying to do is you have probability distribution of foreground, 
probability distribution of background, mean of foreground, mean of background. Okay, so those are the numbers you will need and you can just compute this formula and then you're done. You just try to maximize it. Okay, so and yeah, this is, uh, this is also interesting because uh, in, in <clears throat> one image, if, if you're saying that uh, P1 is the probability of your foreground pixels, then the probability of the background pixels is automatically going to be one minus P1, right? Because you just have two classes. And you know that the sum of probability is also uh, is uh, is always one, so you don't have to compute p one and p two separately. Just compute p one, and you will get p two. And we'll talk about how you, how you can compute p one. All right. So now uh, pay close close attention. This is the uh, the whole uh, the whole uh, algorithm which you you will have to uh, implement. And we don't have to go through like each step. I will just explain uh, it to uh, it to you. And if you have questions later, you can ask and we can go through this again. So you saw that to compute between class variants, you need four numbers. You need P1, P2, Mu1, Mu2, okay? So P1 is probability of your foreground, foreground pixels, probability of background pixels, mean of foreground pixels, mean of background pixels. So let's see how these four numbers are computed. And then basically you just use that formula and that's going to give you between class variance and then we will talk about like what this loop is actually doing here so p1 is probability of any pixel being of uh, being a foreground okay now let's say you you selected like a threshold u which says that all the pixels having intensity less than u are foreground and then greater than u are background Okay, so now you're computing foreground. So you will go from zero to U because all those pixels are your foreground pixels. And what you do is you just compute, like you just count how many, how many such pixels you actually totally have. That's it. So basically in layman terms, if I, if I try to explain it to you, let's say you have thousand pixels in total. All right. And let's say I, set a threshold of 100, uh, which says less than 100 is uh, foreground and greater than 100 is background, then you're just going to count how many pixels have intensity less than 100. Okay, if it's 300 pixels, your P1 is going to be 0.3 because you have 300 pixels which have intensity less than 100. And simply your P2 will be just 0.7, you just subtract by one. Okay, so it's, it's that trivial. You just count like number of pixels you have in foreground and number of pixels you have in background. And again, considering this threshold. And this is important because this threshold is something which you have to compute. So you don't know that threshold, okay? which means that for different threshold, your P1 and P2 is going to change. And that's what we have to optimize here. Now, once you have P1 and P2, you can easily compute mu1 and mu2 as well. Mu1 is just like mean of all the intensities. Basically, we are just, a, we are just taking like uh, the actual intensity value. And then we are just multiplying like how many such pixels we do have. And we just, again, sum all those and then divide by the total probability that's going to give you the mean similarly you can compute mean for the mean for the uh, mean for the second class which is the background class okay so these are simple formulas now once you know that now comes like the tricky part how to find uh, find this uh, u okay so again this is a very simple uh, i will say brute force algorithm if you know what brute force is brute force is something you you try everything all right and everything in this case is you have pixel values ranging from 0 to 255. So basically in brute force, what you will do is you will compute between class variance for threshold 0, for threshold 1, threshold 2, threshold 3, all the way up to 255. So that's the brute force. And that's exactly what this algorithm is going to do. And that's what this loop is actually doing here. So inside this loop, you will compute your interclass variance for all the possible threshold values. Okay, so you start from left, you compute the interclass variance, 
you move to the next step you compute it and then as you move from zero to 255 for whichever threshold value you found that you got like the maximum interclass variance that's a solution that's it all right now this is like a result of this uh, OTSU algorithm so no manual fine-tuning no manual analysis you just use that algorithm you give this image to the algorithm it will give you this output so pretty cool right and this is a very cool visualization of like how this algorithm works the x-axis is showing you different values of threshold starting from zero all the way up to 255 okay the black uh, bar which is actually moving is showing the location when that interclass variance is being computed and the red curve is the actual between class variance computed okay so let's follow from the left when you start from the left the threshold is zero which means that you have let's say zero foreground pixels and all the pixels are just background pixels and again if, we, if you use that formula you will see that your between class variance is actually pretty low okay because the reason is in one of the class all the pixels have value zero i mean there are no pixels right so there is no variance and in all the other one like there is a lot of variance within class that so will give you a very very low number and as you keep keep moving towards the right you will see that your between class variance is actually increasing and it will peak at this position when i think the threshold is something like this and again this is automatically computed so i can't say like why we get uh, this value but we can visually inspect this point kind of separates like these two peak uh, very very nicely right and what is what's trying to optimize is the between class variance is actually maximum at that particular point and that's why that point was chosen okay so next uh, let, let's move on to the next segment uh, in this one, we're going to talk about a region-based approaches for uh, image segmentation, and we'll cover like two different approaches. The first one is we, we will try to merge different pixels to actually grow these regions. And the second is uh, that's kind of a top-down approach where we try to split like different regions to create these smaller segments. Okay, so both are kind of a uh, reverse of each other. And, uh, <clears throat> The, uh, the 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 high level idea remains the same we want to find these uh, close boundaries right uh, and again we'll have to use some kind of similarity measure between uh, the pixels the neighboring pixels to say that they belong to the same group or not okay so the the first one is region growing and the the idea here is uh, uh, we will just rely on the color information let's say or the pixel intensity uh, for now now what we do is we start from like any random pixel which we can say like a seed pixel and we we look at the intensity of that pixel or you can see the color of that pixel if it's a color if it's a colored image and what we try to do is we try to look into the neighborhood and if we see that okay the there is like some similarity with the neighborhood pixels we will try to add the neighborhood pixels to the current seed pixel and we'll keep doing that until we see the similarity metric the similarity threshold is actually meeting okay so that's kind of region growing and we can have like certain criteria for example we don't want regions to grow too much so we can have limit on like number of pixels we can have in each uh, in each a uh, segment or we can set like some kind of threshold like a what should be the threshold when we compute similarity between two pixels Okay, so that threshold will, will play a very important role when we when we create these regions. Okay, so as I said, like similarity criteria, I mean that's uh, alone is not sufficient. We also need like some kind of adjacency neighborhood, and I will explain like why. Because what might happen is, for example, if you just look at this slide over here. Okay, now. If you look at this pixel, it's purely white, right? And then look at like this top right pixel. Again, this is also pure white. So ideally, if you just have to look at like uh, the, the color information, then these two should be like the same segment. But ideally, we don't want like 
pixels that apart to form like a same segment I mean it, it won't look good what we want is we want like neighboring pixels to be close to each other right to form a segment and if to, to give like an example from a real world uh, if you have an image let's say where you have trees okay so you might have a tree on the left bottom you might have a tree on the top right and of course the colors will be all, will be similar because both are trees but then they will be like different segments because they are not close to each other. So that's why the spatial relationship uh, relationship or the closeness of those pixels is also also very important. Okay, so again, this is a very simple algorithm which I explained like in just two sentences uh, earlier. What you have to do is you have to find like distance between uh, the similarity measure, which could be just the intensity of the pixels and use some threshold to say that, okay, they belong to the same segment or not. Okay, and then we we keep storing like some kind of a running average. You, you, you can say, like if you have, let's say, accumulated 10 different pixels and all of them were like within some range, but what we want is we don't want to like keep adding pixels with that variation, right? So we try keep like, try to keep some kind of running average, which says that, okay, this segment has a mean color of or a mean intensity of this value and the reason for that is let's say our threshold is let's say our pixel intensities can vary from 0 to 255 all right now let's say we set a threshold of 5 which says that if two neighboring pixels have intensities where the difference is less than 5 we will say it's, a, it's the same segment right now what may happen is you might have one pixel intensity five then you might have a neighboring pixel intensity nine then intensity 13 17 21 you can go all the way up to 255 with a gap of just four if you don't use running average then what will happen is all those pixels will be just like one segment because they were meeting the threshold and they were adjacent as well right so to to because and that's kind of a gradual increase or a gradual decrease so to take that into account we need to keep like a track of the running average and then what will happen is after some point you might let's say you start with pixel intensity of five let's say you reached uh, until 40 or 45 your average will be like close to maybe 20 25 right and then you won't meet that criteria of uh, the difference of five so that's like one simple example why we uh, why we need this uh, running average and the other issue is like we don't want our segments to grow too big all right so then <clears throat> the third step is like again this is uh, looking into the standard deviation again within within a region and again you can set like some kind of threshold on that you say that okay when you're adding some pixel the standard deviation should not increase this particular threshold okay so you don't want to add like some kind of outliers into your into your segment and again all these are heuristics so you can use these heuristics to design your algorithm now let's quickly run through like uh, how it will look like okay so you'll have to first start with like a seed pixel let's say and again it's done randomly so let's say you start with this underscore and then let's say you have some kind of, so again, you will have to have uh, those thresholds, right? One threshold could be based on pixel intensity. It should not be higher than that. And then of course we will keep like the running average. Then again, you can use like some kind of threshold for variance as well. If adding this pixel is actually changing the variance a lot, then you won't add that pixel. Okay, and of course we'll just look into the neighboring pixels. Now, if this is your seed, then of course you can see that uh, this is one. So definitely this is the segment uh, you're going to add to this pixel. Again, this is one. So you will keep growing those. And again, if uh, zero, if a threshold is less than one, all values will zero will be added. And again, if it's less than two, this I think is also going to add. You can see like at the end, you are getting these two regions. One is A and the second one is B. Okay, and you can see, I mean, kind of, the A was coming from this one as a seed, and the second region is coming from this seven as a starting seed. Okay, and the reason will be beyond this column, like all these pixels have like values greater than 
two, right? So they, they won't meet that threshold. So the way it will work is you will start with one random seed. Let's say this, you create a segment and then you're done. You can't add more pixels. Then again, you will start with the random seed. Let's say this one, you will keep adding and then you're done. So and you get two segments. If more pixels are remaining, you start again. Okay. Now, some interesting examples like where this can be useful. Uh, this is a CT scan. And so let's say this was your starting uh, pixel intensity. Then you will get like some kind of segmentation like this. And again, this is just based on like the intensity of each, each pixel. Okay. If you want, if you're interested in like this segment, you start like uh, at this location and we'll get this segment. So you can see that how this can be very, very useful for doctors. And then in this case, like having a random initial seed is not an issue because the doctor will know exactly like which segment they're interested in. If they're interested in this segment, they can just select it. And then the algorithm will give the segment. Okay. So yeah, again, I think this is just like a run through of the same approach we, we just discussed. And I think uh, in interest of time, let, let's skip this uh, part and it's doing the same thing. So let's say this is the starting seed and it's adding the neighbors, right? And then depending on the value, it will keep adding and it will keep growing, right? So, so in the first step, it's just adding the neighbors, all the, all the, all the circles with negative one. And then it will start with this one and it's added at the segment and it will add one more neighbor, right? So it will keep doing that until all of them are added to the segment, okay? So it's just showing like the, the run through. <clears throat> yeah, we can skip this. This is just trying to compare like uh, what will happen between thresholding and region growing. And so one, like at a high level, I can tell you the difference. So in, in threshold, you you really don't care about like the spatial adjacency or the, the closeness of those pixels, right? That's kind of never taken into account. For thresholding, all you look into is the pixel intensity and you just say whether it's a foreground, it's a background. But in region growing, if you think about this, you are actually taking the spatial proximity of those pixels into account. Okay, so it's more likely that your regions will be like more coherent or they will they will be like in the same uh, spatial proximity okay, as compared to your thresholding. In thresholding, it might happen is that pixels which are far apart in the image might be considered as considered as foreground or background, but that will not happen in region growing. And that's one of the biggest, biggest difference between these two algorithms. So that was region growing. The exact opposite of this is a region splitting. And here the idea is you start with the whole image. You say that, okay, this is your full segment, uh, your, your full segment. And then you figure out, okay, which region actually don't match and you try to break it down. Okay. And again, it's a very, very simple algorithm. Uh, we'll quickly go through this and then I think we'll uh, end it today. So, all right. So here, uh, how, how it works. So the first idea is we'll try to create this kind of uh, graph. It's, it's an adjacency graph and it's called REG, which is region adjacency graph, okay, REG. The idea here is, let's say you have this uh, kind of image patch and you have to create segments. Now, what you will do is you will start from the first level of this graph, which is the whole image. In this case, it's eight cross eight, of course, depending upon like how the, how big the image is. In this case, it's eight cross eight because eight pixels here in the width and eight pixels in the height. Okay, so total 64 pixels. And you say the whole image is one segment. Now, what you do is you divide your image into four different segments, right? Equally into four different segments. And you do that because first what you will see is given a segment, if the if the intensity is actually varying or not. Okay, and again, there can be a lot of properties you, you want to monitor, but in this case, let's say we want to monitor whether the pixel intensity is changing or not. And of course we can make it more sophisticated. We can put some threshold, we can compute standard deviation, all those things, 
but the algorithm, the core algorithm is not going to change. So if I look at this segment, then I see that, okay, this pixel is bright, but this pixel is very dark. So there is some variance. Then I will have to break it. So I will break it into four different regions. One, two, three, and four. And each region will have a resolution of four cross four, okay? Because we have 16 pixels in each of these. All right, now what I do, I keep repeating the same process with all these segments. So I visited one and I saw, okay, all of these are bright pixels and have same pixel intensity, right? So I don't need to break. I already found my segment, okay? So there are no children of this node here. That's my segment. Now let's go to the second one. Second one, we see that again, there are some bright pixels, some dark pixels. Again, we break it down. So we break it down into four. Then again, we go to the third one. Again, it, it's varying a lot, right? So we'll have to break it down. We go to four, all the pixels are dark and the value, values are not changing. Okay? So we don't have to break it down. That's a segment. Then we visit it like the further, uh, if we have any more leaves, we'll go, go to those. And again, you can see that, okay, these are not breaking because they are uniform. This is also uniform, but again, this is uniform, but this was not uniform, right? So we'll have to break that apart. And similarly for other leaves. So we keep breaking, keep breaking until we get like uniform segments. And then later what we do is we try to connect these connected components. Right? We keep track of like which of these segments were actually neighboring. And that's exactly what this red light, uh, red line here is showing. Okay, this four is actually this segment. Right? And then you know that this segment was actually a neighbor of this segment. It's adjacent, right? So you connect those two. And again, this segment is neighbor of this. So you connect those two. And this segment is neighbor of this. So you connect that. But this one over here, it's not neighbor of like any of these. It's right over here. Okay, so this is your created segment, this black region. Here. All right, so that's your region splitting. And it's a very simple algorithm. You start with the whole image and you just check like, okay, whether this region is homogeneous or not. If it's homogeneous, you are done. If it's not homogeneous, you divide it into multiple segments. And for each segment, you will check whether it's homogeneous or not. And you keep repeat, repeating this process for all the child nodes. All right, so again, this is like a simple run through. Uh, you can see like original image. And again, it's not homogeneous. We'll have to break, break into four. Again, this is homogeneous. We don't have to break. And these three will have to break them again, right? So that's the next step. And you can do that I mean it's it's trivial after that. You just keep repeating it. It's kind of a recursive algorithm. I mean, if you if you remember like your depth first search or breadth first search from your algorithm course, then this is exactly the same algorithm. All right, so the next lecture is a continuation of image segmentation. And we we have already studied like a couple of algorithms which can be used for image segmentation. And today we are going to talk about clustering. And clustering is like a, it's a well-known algorithm in machine learning area, but today we will see like how that clustering algorithm can be used uh, specifically to solve this image segmentation task. Okay, so basically we will talk about two different algorithms. The first one is uh, k-means clustering. The second one is mean shift. And uh, for k-means, I think the algorithm which is used for this image segmentation, that's called slick. Uh, the, the full form, I think, is simple linear iterative clustering. And you will see, like, it's really very simple algorithm. And then we'll talk about, like, what are the limitations and how mean shift can be useful in some of the scenarios. All right, so before <clears throat> going to the segmentation part, let's first try to understand, like, the, the motivation behind clustering. Why exactly we need to do clustering? Clustering, it's like a very general approach. The idea is if you have like some samples or some data points, what you want to do is you want to organize those data points into different groups. 
okay and that organization is termed as clustering now the goal is when you organize those data points into those clusters you have two different objectives and these two objectives could be like your loss terms which you try to minimize when you perform clustering okay so the first objective is you want like very high intra class similarity now what do we mean by intra class similarity if two different samples are actually belonging to the same cluster it means that they should be very similar to each other all right so if you have to compute like some kind of number to say that what's your intra class similarity then it will be something like you will try to find out pairwise similarity of all the samples which are there in the cluster okay and when you try to average that that similarity measure should be pretty high if it's high then it means like your clustering algorithm is pretty good okay so that's the first objective the second objective is <clears throat> when you try to compute the same kind of similarity between samples which are across different classes or across different clusters you should get very low score which means that if samples are not similar to each other they should belong to two different clusters all right so they are kind of uh, related to each other but two different objectives altogether okay so we'll try to uh, optimize these two when we talk about these clustering algorithms now another interesting aspect is clustering is a it's it's like from unsupervised uh, unsupervised uh, algorithms uh, category right and in this algorithm we don't need any labels for example, like some of the tasks which we have been studying, for example, classification object detection, you have seen that, okay, to, to be able to do classification, whether it's classical, classical approach, for example, SVM, or it's like a deep learning approach where you're training a CNN, you do need some kind of class labels on those, those images, right? And you use those labels to actually compute your loss function and then train your model. Now, in case of clustering, you don't need any labels. So it's completely unsupervised. All right. And even if you think about like these two objectives, you can compute like these two by, by itself. You don't need labels for that. OK, so you directly learn from data itself. Now, let's see like some simple examples. Uh, try to understand uh, what clustering will do uh, to different kind of problems. And again, it depends on like what's your objective. So, for example, we have like all these characters from, let's say, some comic. And Again, so these each of these individuals is, let's say, your sample point. And now you have to solve some kind of clustering problem. And you will see that depending upon what your objective is, your clustering results will be different. Okay, so for example, let's say we want to perform clustering based on family members. So our two cluster clusters are the first is like this uh, Simpsons family, and the second is the school employees. So if we use these two as clusters, the result which you will obtain is something like this. All these are school employees and all these are like Simpsons family. Okay, so that was the objective you, you had to solve. And again, if you had to solve, and again, your, your samples are not changing. You're just changing the objective. In this case, we are saying that we want two different clusters. The first cluster belongs to females and the second cluster belongs to males. And again, you can see the same data set, so the same sample points your clustering results are different. Okay, so it, it really matters like what uh, you truly want to achieve. <clears throat> and for that, the, the code component of clustering is the similarity measure. How will you compute similarity? Okay, so in, in this particular case, like if you're looking for females, then the features which you will be interested in is like female attributes, which define this property. Okay, for example, in this case, the images I'm showing visually like both of these images are almost similar right if you, if, you, if you look at the color tone it's very similar even if you look at the texture it's pretty similar but again depending upon what you want to achieve these two images might go to different clusters or they might go to the same cluster okay for example let's say if you have to categorize like objects based on whether the hair are brown or curly then they might go into the same category on the other hand, if we have to cluster, okay, we want to separate like animals versus maybe humans or dogs versus females, right? Then they will fall into different clusters. 
So it, it boils, boils down to like what kind of uh, problem you want to solve and how will you determine that similarity score between different samples. So for example, when I said like, if you're looking into like hair, whether they're curly or not, whether they're brown or not, then the similarity measure will be, could be like, you might want to detect these kind of features, right? Whether you have curly hairs or not. You don't care whether this is a dog or this person. And if it's like a human versus animal, then again, you will look different into different kinds of features for that. Okay, and again, so depending upon that, you might have to choose like different kinds of features. Features could be based on colors, intensity, location, texture, and a lot of other factors. Now, even if you have the features, then the next question is how you're going to actually say that two different samples are similar. To be able to do that, you need some kind of similarity or you can say like distance metric, right? So the idea will be given two samples. You will have some kind of function which will take these two samples as input and it's going to extract some features. We don't know what features it will be looking into and it's going to give you some kind of numbers. And this number will be used to estimate whether these two samples are similar or not. All right. Similarly, you can have like two different words and you might get like some kind of number for that, whether they are similar or not. And again, this function will vary from problem to problem. It will depend upon what kind of features you're looking into. And then again, how you're matching those features. Okay. So you need this kind of distance metric to perform clustering. And this is a very interesting problem if you, if you look at uh, these two examples on the right. So these two are like, let's say words, but maybe in different languages. And they might mean similar things. So the semantic meaning is not changing, which means that if you're looking into semantics of these words, you might get like a very high similarity score, or you can say like very small distance measure, right? But if you want to differentiate between different languages, like whether these words come from different languages or not, or same language or not, then again, you might need a function which will give you like a number which is pretty high. All right. Now, if you look at these two images, so this is like a fingerprint, uh, <clears throat> fingerprint image right, from a scanner. Now, as a human, if you look into these two images, I mean, both are fingerprint. Okay, so now if you just want to say that whether these are fingerprint images or not, we can say they are pretty much similar. But in, in, in like application point of, from application point of view, we might not be interested in that because that's trivial, these are fingerprints. What we might be interested in is whether these two fingerprints are coming from the same individual or not. And if they are not, then we need like some kind of metric function which says that, okay, these fingerprints are from different individuals. So it, it boils down to what you want to achieve and that will determine what kind of function, what kind of features you're going to use. Okay, so that was like the motivation uh, or some of the background that you need for clustering. Let's directly jump into K-means uh, algorithm and then later we'll see how we can use K-means algorithm for this uh, segmentation problem, all right? Again, K-means is a very uh, popular algorithm for clustering and uh, the idea is pretty simple. What we want to do is we have like some set of sample points and we want to start with, all right, so in this data set, let's say we have 10 different categories or 10 different clusters. So that's the starting point which we need for k-means and that's one of the limitation. Beforehand, we need to know how many different categories we have in our uh, data set. And then the end goal is you will distribute each of that sample point to one of those categories. And that's what the schemes algorithm is going to do, uh, do for you, okay? The, the basic algorithm, it's a iterative algorithm, which means that you start with like some cluster centers and you perform assignment. You say that, okay, this sample belongs to this cluster. So you assign all the samples in your data set to one of those clusters. And then you keep repeating that process, which like iteratively improves that cluster assignment. And at the end, the two objectives which you discussed where uh, we are focusing on like low similarity for intra-class samples and very uh, sorry high similarity for intra-class samples and very low similarity for inter-class uh, samples. So we try to meet those two objectives. 
and then we end when uh, we can't improve it anymore. Okay, so let's try to understand k-means using a very simple uh, example here. Uh, so again, we have these, uh, this is a data set we have, and these are your sample points. Okay, so each of these uh, dot is a sample. Uh, again, like this is projection on 2D space. You can easily generalize it to high dimensional space. So these are all the samples. And let's say we say, let's say we have three different clusters. And again, as I said, this is like a limitation of k-means. We need to know beforehand how many clusters we want. The first one is blue, the red one, and the pink one. Now what we do, we randomly initialize these centers among these points. Okay, so we know, we know this Euclidean space. We will randomly put these centers somewhere. Okay, so that's the starting point. Now, once that is done, we try to assign each of the sample point to these centers. And that's basically based on how similar that sample is to this cluster center. And in this case, since this is Euclidean space, we can just use the distance from this point to the center. Now, if you do that, you see that all these points, which are actually closer to this uh, blue uh, square here, all they will be uh, blue. Now, these two points were closer to the, the red one. So these are marked as red. And all these four were closer to the pink one. They are marked as pink. So that's like one step of your k-means clustering algorithm. Okay, so in that first step, what you did, you in randomly initialize your centers, and then you assign every sample to these centers based on the closeness or the similarity. Now, what you do, you keep repeating this process over and over again. Okay. Now, in the second step, what will happen, you will take all these uh, blue points and you will try to update the center, the cluster center. And that will basically be basically the, the mean of all these points. Okay, so you can look at like uh, all these blue points. If you compute the mean, so the mean will be like in the x direction and the y direction, depending upon what are the x and y coordinates of these points. So you can see like the cluster center was at this location, it moved to this location. You will do the same for red uh, cluster, and you can see it's basically at the center of these two points, because you only have two points, and the average is going to be at the center. Similarly, for the pink one, this will be the center uh, based on these four points. Right now, you again reassign. What you will do, you will go through each of the sample points, you will find the distance from all the cluster centers, and again, you will do the reassignment. So basically, all these four points are again going to be blue. But this point over here, now it's actually closer to this uh, red point, right? So this is going to be red. And these assignments are not going to change. Okay, because these are still closer to the pink one. So that's the second step. You again, repeat the same process. You will find the center. And you can see that the center for the pink is not going to change because the assignment was uh, not updated. But the center for red will change because we have a new point now. Okay, so this will come maybe to this point. And blue might change because this was snatched away and the red took it. Okay, so it will move, it will move. And again, you will do reassignment. And this point again is claimed by this one because it's closer to that center. And you keep repeating that. And unless like the, if the points are not changing, the centers are not changing, you say that, okay, we are done now. And at the end, you can see that you have three different clusters, the blue one, the red one, the pink one. And you can say like all these points belong to one category, which is blue. This belongs to red category. This belongs to pink category. And this was completely unsupervised. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so that was like the simple algorithm. As I said, it's iterative. And uh, we, we have to like perform that those two uh, steps like in each iteration, which is kind of readjusting the cluster center and then again performing the reassignment. So for that, like uh, again, we need a distance measure. In this case, we see we can just use the distance between those two points because it's secret in space. But you can imagine like if you are working in, in terms of features, which will be like high dimensional, for example, five and two dimensional or something. But again, in that case, you can compute the Euclidean distance between those two points, right? So that will still be uh, still be valid. 
Okay, so the first question is what uh, distance means, and most of the times you will use a uh, Euclidean distance because you are working in terms of features. So for spatial data, that's actually uh, that works pretty well. The another interesting question is, so the the demo we 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 uh, discussed, we started like the points initially. Initially, we started it randomly, right? We just choose like any any points, and then you can imagine this kind of algorithm is not deterministic because what will happen is the initialization uh, the initialization step is random which means that if you run this algorithm multiple times you might end up with different results and that that that, that actually happens a lot okay so different results will be different so there are like different ways to address that and one way is you can actually choose like some of these points as uh as initial point instead of just randomly picking it okay so that's one solution but again that still makes it like doesn't make it make it makes it deterministic because again you're choosing those points randomly but uh the other way you can do is maybe you can take like some kind of averaging of multiple points together right so there are different ways to resolve this but still like there is some kind of stochasticity there which makes it like uh non-deterministic so yeah, I think all this is good. Uh, that's the mean calculation, that's fine. Yeah, so this is an interesting point. Like, so when you are running uh, that algorithm iteratively, essentially the loss function, which you're trying to minimize, you're not explicitly minimizing this, but essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to minimize the distance of every sample between uh, every sample to its assigned cluster center right so that that's what you're trying to minimize because if that distance is not minimal then you can assign that sample to some other cluster center if that is the minimal one and that's the ob whole objective right that's how you do the reassignment and basically if you think about this each iteration you have to compute distance of each sample to all the cluster centers which means that you will compute that distance and then you have to perform some kind of sorting. And then you will pick like the shortest distance. And this is exactly showing you that the distance of each sample to the assigned cluster center. Okay. And then you add like all those distances for all the samples. And that's like what the, you can say if you want to say like a loss function or something, which will get minimized. All right, so these are some of the variations or you can say the parameters uh, you have to choose. The first one is how many cluster centers to use. And that's like, I will say one of the biggest limitation of k-means because since this is like an unsupervised algorithm, most of the time we don't know how many clusters we have. So that is something which can be estimated. Uh, and one simple solution is you can actually try different number of centers and just run that algorithm multiple times and then you can compute that loss function and for whichever number the loss function is actually minimal you can choose that as a solution okay the other issue is when to stop the the, the demo which we discussed uh, it was easy because the cluster changer uh, the cluster center was not changing so we can stop because there's no point in performing like more iterations right there's nothing happening there it's everything is fixed the other way is you can actually fix the number of iterations. So for example, you have some kind of computation restrictions. So you can limit, okay, we'll only perform 10 iterations or 20 iterations, and then we will stop. And again, like if the cluster centers are not changing, or you can say also like partitions are not changing. For example, the points are not jumping between like uh, different cluster centers. That could be like a good convergence uh, criteria as well. All right, so the the initialization, as as I said, it it's, it plays a very big role because since it is done you know, it, it is done uh, randomly. So, for example, if you have this kind of initialization, right, second point and third point, there is no way like uh, these cluster centers are actually going to move around to this side. So basically, you will just get like a big cluster like this, okay. And then these three points will have to be divided between these two. And more, more, most likely, I think this will be one cluster center with just one point. 
and these two might be another one depending upon like how far they are from these cluster centers so again you can see like the initialization makes a big difference okay and these are like some of the heuristics which which can be used as i said you try like multiple starting points all right and then you can compute like that loss function for whichever uh try like you are getting the minimum loss function you just choose that uh, as a result okay so again randomly picking examples that was another variation which we uh, discussed this is interesting what you can do is you you can divide your euclidean space like into different different segments right and then make sure that whenever you choose your center it belongs to one of those uh, segments so that way you are making sure that your at least your centers are actually spread out equally in your in your data points within your data points right so that's like a good heuristic which can be used uh, sometimes okay so that's k means uh, clustering now let's see how that can be used for image segmentation and basically this this is just one slide i have and you can you have seen like how simple that k means algorithm is and now you will see like how simple this slick algorithm is so that, this was proposed in uh, 2012 and so the idea is you will use this k-means clustering over images and the pixels of the images will be your sample points okay so for example if you have like let's say 300 cross 300 image so you will have that many pixels and basically each pixel is your data point and what you're going to do is you're going to use some kind of properties of that pixel and basically it could be like the rgb color all right so those three values and it could be the location of that pixel where exactly that pixel is located in this image okay so we use those uh, five different uh, values so in this case your feature vector is five dimensional r g b and then x and y x y is for the position of the pixel rgb is for the color component and later we'll see we don't use rgb color space uh, we use like a different lab color space which is which is fine you can use any other color space as well hsv or something else but the idea is to use the appearance okay so then each pixel is represented using this feature vector which is five dimensional long and then we just run this k-means clustering using those data points now one interesting question to ask is what is the role of number of cluster centers now the number of cluster centers will determine how many segments you will get in your segmented image for example if you set your number of cent uh, cluster centers to 1000 then you are going to get 1000 different segments in that image okay which could be something like this on the top left right and as you keep reducing the number of cluster centers you can see that your segments are actually getting bigger and fewer in number and as you go down you can see like this is even like coarser so your segments are much bigger and you can see like how clean this these results are and that's one of the reasons like this algorithm is still used today for like a lot of lot of applications and we are using this for i think several of, uh, of our research projects as well so it's a very simple algorithm very efficient gives you very good results okay so this is like the, the input is an image the algorithm is k-means and this is going to be your output now let's see step by step like how this kind of output can be generated what we do we first of all initialize the cluster centers so that's the first step for a k-means algorithm okay and the way we do it is we divide your image into like multiple grids depending upon how many cluster centers you want for example if you want 100 different cluster centers you will create a grid of 10 cross 10 and then within each grid cell you will randomly pick one of the pixel as a cluster center okay and as i said earlier uh, you will have a five dimensional feature vector you will have uh, three for colors and x5 for position we need position because it may happen that for example like pixel over here if it's like very dark pixel the values might be zero zero and zero similarly the pixels over here they are also zero 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 if you just use color they will be clustered together but there is no way they are like the same segment right they are far apart in the image 
and that's why we need like this position uh, value as a feature okay we want like pixels which are close to each other as one segment okay so the second step and again this is ideally not required it's it's just again a heuristics even if you skip this it's not going to change like a lot in terms of result and the idea is we we first try to compute like the gradient of the image and whatever whatever cluster center we have initialized we move it to a location where we have the smallest gradient okay so let's try to understand why this step is required as i said i mean for some images it might like uh, change the performance but most of the times it won't do uh, a lot okay but let's try to understand the intuition so you have seen that when you compute gradients in your image then if there is a high gradient it means that the color values might be changing a lot right so that might be an edge and that's what you use for edge detection algorithm so if gradient is high then if it's an edge which means that you are at a boundary of like two different segments and that's not like a good initialization because then you don't know like which way to go and that's why what we do is we simply shift the cluster centers to like a smallest gradient and if the gradient is low we mean we know that okay it's not an edge and it might be like a same segment okay so we just try to move towards the center of the segment so that's the second step and it's just done once so again the first step is done once then this is also once then this is like the iteration for uh, the k-means algorithm which will be repeated again and again to refine the results okay so again this is like the the traditional like step which we do for k-means clustering what we will do is we will compute like the, the cluster assignment so for each pixel location we will compute the distance using these set of features which are five different values and we will use that distance to actually assign the cluster center okay so this is the cluster assignment and then again what we will do is we will recompute the the center of the cluster right based on the the new assignments we have and that will shift your cluster center okay so these are the two traditional steps in k-means we just keep repeating those two steps until we can have like some kind of uh, stop stopping criteria whether we want to stop after 10 iteration 20 iteration or we can stop like when the cluster centers are not changing and at the end you will get like this uh, nice quality result and you can see that I mean these segments are solely based on the the color value right and also like if they're close to each other uh, they are actually grouped into the same segment one thing you will notice is two segments which are close to each other even if the colors are similar they are actually separate cluster centers and the reason is because distance also plays a role and you can see like most of the time you will see like a straight line dividing those two segments okay and if you want to relate that to the i think one of the algorithm which we discussed the 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 k nearest neighbor algorithm right how the decision boundary looks like so this these straight lines actually explain like those decision boundaries so this will happen only where like you have uniform color not for like other locations where there's some gradient or something okay so i think uh, some interesting properties about this algorithm it's pretty fast to run even for like images of this resolution it can be like done in fraction of seconds and that's why it's used for like in a lot of real, uh, real time applications if you need like a regular super pixels uh, it's very useful so these segments are actually called super pixels okay now some of the uh, downsides like you might miss some of the thin objects because if you think about this uh, color is a factor which is uh, playing an important role when you create uh, when you're creating these clusters but then distance is also important so because of distance most of the time you will see that the segments are actually rounded shaped right because that will make it uniform and that's why like if your objects are like uh, have thin shape they they will be ignored so to take into uh, that into account what you can do is when you are computing the distance between like the cluster center and the pixel point you can actually assign some kind of weights to colors and position 
Okay, so let's say you want to pay less attention to the distance, more attention to the color, then it may happen that, okay, your segments will not be like rounded shape. Then you will get like all odd kind of shapes as well. All right, so yeah, that's, that, that was slick. And uh, let's uh, quickly move on to mean shift and then we'll take like all the questions uh, at the end. Now, one limitation of k-means is you need to know like how many cluster centers you want. Okay, and the second algorithm which we are going to discuss, uh, which is mean shift, it actually tries to resolve that. So this algorithm will automatically figure out how many cluster centers we have. And again, this is a clustering algorithm. And these are like some sample results from uh, this mean shift algorithm. We will briefly go over uh, how this algorithm works. But now if you compare this with like the slick algorithm which we discussed, it's, it's quite different, right? It's able to like uh, create bigger segments for you if they are similar. For example, this lake and uh, these trees over here, right? So if you are interested in like uh, getting these kind of uh, outputs where there's some kind of semantic meaning to these uh, patches, then mean shift is actually better than slick because slick is just giving you over clustering. It's just dividing all the patches, okay? Now let's try to understand how uh, mean shift work. First of all, uh, it's trying to address the issue of number of clusters, which was required in K-mean. So we don't need uh, to know like how many cluster centers we have. We'll try to automatically detect that. And the main idea behind mean shift is it, it tries to find the density in your density in your data. Okay. Now let's try to understand uh, what that means. For example, this input image over here, right? If you will take each pixel location and uh, let's say you have, let's say you have some kind of, you're just looking at the intensity of each pixel, right? So it might look something like this if you plot like a scattered, uh, scattered visualization of these pixels. Okay, so I think this is showing you uh, this is the lab space, I think, here. So V is like the intensity. And I think this is HSV space. So this is giving you like color, the color value, the, the hue. And V is like the brightness of the pixel. And the third one is the, the saturation of the pixel. Okay, so basically you are just trying to plot each point into this three-dimensional space. You could have done with RGB as well, which is perfectly fine. Now, what I wanted to show here is, if you look at these points, so each of these, uh, these points belongs to like one of the pixels in this image. Okay. Now, if you carefully look at this uh, distribution, you can see like there is a highly dense region here, right? And all these points are then scattered. You might say, okay, this is a dense region here as well. Then again, a dense region here. So what mean shift tries to do is it tries to find these denser regions and these are, like treated as distributions. So then what mean shift will say that, okay, this is some kind of distribution and all the points which are actually inside this region, they are sampled from this distribution. Okay, so it's kind of trying to do distribution modeling and which is quite different from like the way uh, Slick was working because in this case, like the, the distribution of the points will play a very, very major role. Okay, so these are also called, you can say like local maxima or some kind of modes. Okay. So wherever you have this high density, you say that, okay, this is one of the mode in your input image. And these might be like based on the colors you have. For example, if you have yellow color, you will get like one mode for yellow color, maybe one mode for white color, one mode for pink color. So whatever different distributions you have, which can form like some kind of grouping, this algorithm is going to figure those things out automatically. Okay, another uh, interesting example over here. You can see that, uh, for example, this dark circle here. So all these pixels which are inside this circle, they, they, they are forming this tight group, right? And this is just one segment. And if you have to say, okay, from which distribution this is coming, all these pixels will be like very close to each other. If you try to plot, let's say some kind of histogram from these pixel values. All right, so what mean shift tries to do is, it tries to find out center of such distributions. 
Okay, for example, let's say this is some kind of initialization. You have this uh, red box. It will try to move towards the center of that distribution. So for example, if this uh, blue bar chart over here is just showing you the histogram of the, of the pixels you have uh, at this region, right? So what this uh, mean shift will try to do is it will try to fit this box perfectly on this distribution. Okay, and again, this is an iterative approach. And uh, the idea is like, uh, okay, let me quickly jump to the algorithm itself. Uh, I think it will be a uh, lot, lot easier to understand. So again, this is like, uh, let's say your uh, sample points. And what we do is we again start, start from like some random location. And we try to find like some kind of like uh, the mode for the uh, mode for the uh, from the data. So we, we try to move that initial location to the densest region we can have in, in the samples. Okay, for example, let's say we start from this point. Now, one interesting parameter you still have this in, uh, in this algorithm is the search window. Okay, how big your search window is going to uh, going to be, and that will control how big your segments will be. If you use a very big search window, which means you are like maybe searching the, uh, the entire image, then your segments might cover like the whole image. But if your search window is very small, then again, you're trying to find maybe small segments within your image. Okay, so you have this parameter, which is called search window. Now you start with the random location, you have some parameter for the search window. Let's say you have this radius. So this will be a search window. Then what you will do is, within this region you will try to find out where is the highest density inside this search window and we can visually see that it's somewhere here right and you can easily compute that by computing the mean of all these points okay so that's you can also say like kind of a center of mass so what we do is when we iterate like uh, in in this algorithm we try to move these randomly initialized points toward these high dense regions and this is called like mean shift vector because what we are doing is we are computing the mean and then we are shifting the initialized center towards this uh, mean okay so we go there and then we repeat the process again and then you can easily visualize what's happening here is we are just trying to move towards the denser region in your data And we will stop like when the mean shift vector is not changing at all. Okay, so then this is going to give you center for one of the mode. And the idea is whatever pixels actually we moved through to obtain the center, all those pixels will actually belong to that center. Right? Because if these pixels didn't belong to the center, then when we are initializing at this location, we might have went to some other direction. Okay, but we followed this direction, which means that whatever pixels are on the way, they actually belong to this particular mode. Okay, so that's one important thing. The second important thing is we might end up, when we start with multiple points, we might end up at the same mode, at the same location. And in that case, what we do is we just merge those two segments together. So what might happen is we might have started at this location as well because we are doing it randomly. Then that might have also end up at this location and all those pixels will also belong to this particular segment. Okay, so what we do, we start with like multiple locations and then we will reach at a location uh, which is called like the mode. And then all the all these starting points which are merging to the same location, they will be merged as a segment. And of course, we'll merge to like different modes if we have multiple modes. And each of those modes is going to give you one of the segment. Okay, so this uh, bandwidth is like the, uh, the search window, which is a very important uh, factor. And basically, this is the algorithm which we just discussed. We start like a uh, start with like some of the uh, kernels which are initialized randomly we have some search window and for each search window we compute the mean 
we compute the mean shift vector, move in that direction, and keep repeating this until the algorithm is converged. So there are some similarities to how uh, how uh, k means algorithm work. Okay. So yeah, I think all this is fine. Uh, so this is just showing you the trajectory, like how if this was initialized at this point, how this moved. And basically, all these points which are inside this trajectory will be part of the part of the same segment. Okay, so that was clustering algorithm, and that's again a very very general algorithm which is used for image segmentation. Now, how we can use that for image segmentation? It's the same analogy we see for like uh, how we do uh, k means to slick. We'll do the same thing here. Your pixels are actually your sample points. And you can use like the color values. And of course, you have the location. And then within your image, again, you will do random initialization of all those kernels. You will have some kind of search window. And for each search window, you will just repeat those steps. And of course, in this case, one interesting aspect is you can actually run that those two steps uh, parallel in parallel for all the, uh, all the initialized points. There is no dependency. And once each point is converged, later you can easily merge points which are actually converging to the same mode. Okay, so that makes like the algorithm very efficient as well. So, and again, this is showing one uh, simple visualization how you can find like different modes, right? And this is again from the, the image which I showed you earlier. Uh, this is just like a 2D projection of that uh, 3D space. And this is along with the colors. You can see like yellow color over here, then blue, then pink. Okay, and how each of these colors is actually trying to get like separate modes. And these red dots are like the identified modes using mean shift. So here you can see that the in this like hilly of visualization, the higher the point, the denser that point is. And you can see that it's very dense over here, right? So this high density region is actually reflected by this part over here and at the top is like your your mode and you can see that peak of peaks of like these uh, distributions is actually one of the modes okay. now let's quickly look at like some sample uh images uh how mean shift uh, mean shift gives you segmentation so this is the input image and you can get something like this okay so this is just showing like different colors and you can see like the whole green patch over here was connected as one segment, which is quite different from uh, the result which we expect from a slick kind of algorithm, right? So one interesting difference between mean shift and slick is slick will give you like regular shaped uh, segments, those super pixels, right? So the, the, the size of those super pixels won't change a lot. More or less, it will be similar for different segments, but that's not the case with mean shift it will depend upon like how big the object is okay you have stone like this which is pretty small but you have bigger segments as well okay so again this is a very nice uh, visualization of a main shift so this is a colored image and these are all rgb points visualized like in the 3d space now you can see that when mean shift was uh, operated over this you will find like different modes there right and that's exactly as shown in the bottom figure here. So you just converted like, this is kind of, you're trying to discretize your pixel values. Okay, so in this case, you have just this flat red, but in this case, you have variations of red, right? But when you make that flat, you just get one segment here. And again, this is a pretty a nice example from real world image, right? It's very noisy, but still that algorithm is very, very robust. And you can see like how the how different modes are actually converging. So you started from different uh, locations. So for some points, it converged pretty quickly, but for some points, it's still trying to converge. Okay, so now we are done. So you can see like this is kind of several iterations, maybe 80 or 100 iterations. And then the idea is like, 
wherever like uh, wherever uh, these pixels were actually moving when we were converging, all of them actually belong to that that particular segment. And you can get like with that kind of convergence, this is the result you will you will get. Maybe you can see like pretty pretty decent, right? Some of the text is actually also segmented. Okay, so the good thing about mean shift is we don't need like any uh, any estimation of how many clusters we have to uh, how we have to uh, we, we have to determine right it will do it automatically for you and it doesn't matter like how many modes you have in your color so for example some images might have just two modes or two segments it will work in that case as well some images might have hundreds of different segments it will operate in that case as well and very robust to out outliers because you can see because we, we are trying to compute like mean over uh, uh, a larger area right so even if we have some outliers as pixels i think they will be easily filtered out and we only need one parameter which is like the window size what should be your search size and which is kind of reasonable because you you know that how big your segments should be so depending upon that you can easily set that window size Okay, some of the drawbacks, not drawbacks, but again, I will say properties, uh, the output will depend highly on the window size, and that's, that's fine. It's computationally expensive because again, it's iterative and you can imagine like each step you have to compute that mean. Okay, and depending upon like how many initialization points you have, you have to do that for all of all of those points. So the idea is like if you have very high dimensional data, so for images, it's fine if you're just using like let's say the colors of the position it's five dimensional vector but if it's high dimensional space for example thousand dimensional space it can be very very computation expensive so not not easily scalable 